from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone. It's, it's my great pleasure as Librarian of Congress to welcome you to this presentation of the John W. Kluge Prize for Lifetime Achievement in the Study of Humanity. This award has been created through the generosity of John Kluge, who, together with his wonderful wife, is here with us tonight. Um, it's uh, for a prize uh, that we are grateful to him, but also for much else that he has done for the nation's library as the founder and longtime chairman of its principal private sector support group, many of whose members are here also, the James Madison Council. So, John Kluge, on behalf of all of us, thank you. This prize has been created in the Library of Congress, so I also want to thank at the outset the many members of Congress who are here tonight, especially Representative Ellers and Senator Stevens, who are the current chair and vice chair of the Congress's oldest joint committee of the two houses, the Joint Committee on the Library of Congress. And I also want to thank members of the Madison Council, who will be meeting tomorrow under its current distinguished and long long-time friend of the library, uh, Chairman Ed Cox. Now, the Kluge Prize is a unique international award. It covers all languages, all cultures, and the broad fields across cultures of the humanities and social sciences, uh, disciplines conspicuously not included in the Nobel Prizes. Tonight, we honor John Hope Franklin and Yu, Xing, Yu Ying Shi, two scholars who have each produced an enormous amount of scholarship and presented it in a wide variety of formats to a wide variety of grateful audiences. Each of these two has played a leading and groundbreaking role in bringing into the mainstream of scholarship important and previously neglected aspects of the history of their respective native lands. Moreover, the scholarship of each has affected both the consciousness and the conscience of a broader public in a unique way in both cultures during the second half of the 20th century. They have both seen, in addition, that deep values lodged at the very core of their respective cultures provide a basis for understanding, correcting, and moving beyond past abuse and neglect towards a better future. Our first awardee this evening is John Hope Franklin, who has been the leading scholar in the second half of the 20th century in establishing African American history as an inescapably key area in the study of the American past. He has been both a pathfinder and a model for other scholars, for the broader public, the long and complex history of race in this country has been opened up over the course of 63 years by this amazing man. He has produced works of many different types and of consistent quality. He has reached a broader audience with a celebrated textbook, a biography, an autobiography, and his personal leadership in a lengthy dialogue on race that ranged all over America in the final years of the 20th century. He has broken all records in honorary degrees of Guinness kept the track of this, they would take due note. And he is currently Emeritus Professor of History at Duke University, which has named a Center for Interdisciplinary and International Studies in his honor. He provided historical depth for the argumentation used in the landmark Supreme Court ruling of Brown versus the Board of Education. And he is an international, as well as a national hero having played a leading role in saving the worldwide Fulbright program while he was chairman of its board during a period when that program's budgetary future seemed most endangered. Dr. Franklin, it is an honor to confer on you the Kluge Prize for Lifetime Achievement in the Study of Humanity, and I respectfully request that you come forward to receive this.
Thank you very much, Dr. Billington. I'm deep, deeply honored by Mr. Kluge, Dr. Billington, and all of my colleagues whose confidence in my efforts have endured to the point that they supported my candidacy for this great honor. That the Library of Congress played a significant role in the entire process of selecting the recipients and administering the Kluge Award is not at all surprising to me. You see, I have the feeling that the Librarian of Congress and his staff have kept a wary, a wary eye on me for the past 67 years. <laughs> I came to the Library of Congress for the first time in 1939 with every intention of rewriting the history of the United States in a way that would be palpably inclusive. It was not easy for a 24-year-old graduate student to persuade Willard Webb, then the study room supervisor, that I qualified for a study room for whatever I was doing. I succeeded in persuading him, and almost every morning for the next several months, Mr. Webb, as he made his rounds, would stop and have a few words with me. He commented that I must be quite interested in Thomas Jefferson, since I kept his notes on Virginia on my desk, and it was frequently open. So one day he asked me if I found it helpful, and I told him that it was invaluable for what I was attempting to do, and that was to confront the numerous misconstructions of the history of the United States by some of the most influential thinkers in our history. He wondered what role Jefferson played in what I was attempting to do. I merely replied that his negative influence was enormous. <laughs> <laughs> Although the average observer did not see beyond his obvious influence as a founding father and as the author of the Declaration of Independence. I was not yet prepared to share with Mr. Webb, or indeed any others, my view of Jefferson's enormous influence in arguing that African Americans were inferior to whites in many ways. Jefferson insisted, for example, that since blacks required less sleep than whites, even after a hard day's work, they could be induced by the slightest amusement to sit up until midnight. Yet he continued, continued since their existence appeared to, quote, participate more of sensation than reflection, unquote, they were disposed to sleep when abstracted from their diversions or unemployed in labor like an animal who is at rest. Thanks to Willard Webb and his successors, and thanks to Dr. Billington and his predecessors, I have been permitted to explore the wellspring of American history from the 17th century to the present. Thanks also to the John W. Kluge Center, I was able, as one of the first senior fellows at the Library of Congress, Kluge Senior Fellows at the Library of Congress, to explore even more intensively certain aspects of recent American history. Meanwhile, I have spent days at a time, weeks at a time, and months at a time enjoying the, res the resources of what I call this eighth wonder of the world, the Library of Congress. What I have found, among many other things, has been a persistent effort on the part of some who should know better to explain certain developments in American history as the inevitable result of using, say, Africans to play certain roles. Thus, the Jeffersonian argument goes as follows. If a, slave works as hard, if a slave works hard under the lash, he is quick to fall asleep when the lash no longer forces him to perform certain tasks. Remarkable finding. <laughs> Further, if he does not manifest an attachment to a certain way of doing things, he's likely to become attached by instinct to another way of doing things. Fantastic even if elementary. <laughs> Finally, since, quote, blacks secrete less by the kidneys and more by the glands of the skin, they have a strong and disagreeable odor, uh, un end of quote, to which I have added, especially since in all likelihood they are worked in the fields or in the kitchens for 12 or 15 hours or even more a day without an opportunity to bathe. The more I have studied the history of our country over the last 70 years, the clearer it has become to me 
By now, I have come to understand the nature of American society and the certainty of many of its participants that their own position is clear and correct. I have attempted to re-examine the ideologies that undergird our system. I have also struggled to understand how it is that we seek a land of freedom for the people of Europe and at the same time establish a social and economic system that enslaved people who happen to be, happen not to be from Europe, are kept in that position. I have struggled to understand how it is that we could fight for independence and at the very same time use that newly won independence to enslave many who had joined in the fight for independence. As a student of history, I have attempted to explain it historically, but that, that explanation has not been at all satisfactory. That has left me no alternative but to use my knowledge of history and whatever no other knowledge I, and skills I have to present the case for change in keeping with the expect purpose, express purpose of attaining the promised goals of equality for all peoples. In this way, we can perhaps realize the goals that grow out of the tenets to which we claim to have been committed from the beginning. It is a sad fact that it was in my generation that one witnessed the first African Americans achieving some recognition in the field of scholarship. Until then, few white Americans, even those who advocated a measure of political equality, subscribed to the view that African Americans had the ability to think, either abstractly or concretely, or to understand and assimilate ideas that had been formulated by others. Much of the 20th century was spent by African American scholars knocking on the door of American scholarship and seeking entry. Only here and there did the door open, and all too often it was open grudgingly, if at all. It was this inability to open wide the door of American scholarship that caused William E.B. Du Bois to comment in 1903 on his own intellectual loneliness when he said, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. Across the color line I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, while smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out the caves of evening that swing between the strong-limbed earth and the tracery of stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will, and they have come all graciously with no scorn nor in condescension. So, wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. Is this the life you grudge me, O knightly America? Is this the life you long to change into the dull, red hideousness of Georgia? Are you so afraid, lest peering from this high Pisgah between Philistine and Amalekite, we sight the promised land?" End of quote. But it is not enough merely to sight the promised land in the distance, and Du Bois would be the first to be dissatisfied with such a modest goal. He insisted always that the people for whom he spoke should never be satisfied with something so ephemeral as a promised land. And when he reached the conclusion that the land of his birth would never concede full and equal citizenship for him, he renounced it, the country, and denounced it and retreated to Ghana, where he spent the remaining few years of his life. But we who are dissatisfied with the present condition in this country should not retreat to Ghana or somewhere else, nor should we even desire to do so. Our past is here. Our loyalty is here. Our presence is here. Our investment of more than three centuries is here. Our future is here. Many years ago, I discovered that there were various ways that a historian could utilize his training and talents to move this nation closer to the principles for which so many have made the supreme sacrifice to achieve. So in 1948, Thurgood Marshall, the chief counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, sought my assistance in breaking the color barrier at the University of Kentucky. A young African-American was seeking admission to do graduate work in history at the University of Kentucky. When he was denied admission, surprise, surprise, Marshall sued 
and ask me to serve as an expert witness in the effort to establish the fact that the University of Kentucky was the only publicly supported institution where you could secure graduate training in history. Before I could testify regarding the inadequacy of Kentucky's historically black college in training graduate students in history, the federal judge had ordered the admission of the African-American graduate student to the University of Kentucky. Even without my public participation in the argument, I discovered that my role as an expert witness could assist in bringing about change and equity in our society. And this could be done without compromising my scholarship one whit. Some years later, a variation of the same was true in Brown versus the Board of Education, when I discovered that I could use my training and my knowledge to assist counsel in gaining the admission of Linda Brown and the other plaintiffs to public schools that were not segregated in 1954. Then, some years later, in 1965, I discovered in the Selma Montgomery March that I could be effective in joining other historians, as well as crusaders of various stripes, in marching and working together to impress high and arrogant powers and to relent in their extreme and excessive use of racial and social bigotry in their effort to maintain the status quo. I've been most fortunate in having the opportunity to participate in an exciting and rewarding educational experience over the past three quarters of a century. At the same time, I have been able to witness the partial transformation of our society into something more in keeping with the expressed aspirations of our founding fathers. I have been most fortunate in having the support of scholars and colleagues in many parts of the country and of the world. I can only hope that my work will be a part of the legacy, not only of my students and others who find it possible that we can, under certain circumstances, do something that's effective and supportable. But I also hope that one can find something valuable in my words, but also those who have found some validation of their own work in what I've tried to say and do. Thank you. Your applause speaks louder than any words could in saying thank you, John Hope Franklin. Our second awardee, Yu Ying Shi, has been described by his peers as the most widely read contemporary historian writing in Chinese, and, and I'm, these are quotes, the greatest Chinese intellectual historian of our generation. Working deeply with original texts, he has rescued the rich Confucian heritage and much else in Chinese culture, its ancient and rich culture, from caricature, neglect, and has even, uh, beginning with the original texts following Confucian thought in its own right and in its interaction with other elements of Chinese and indeed later of Western thought and experience. Um, so that he's really covered the entire multi-millennial history of and range of Chinese thought and experience. His scholarship has reached across many disciplines, time periods, and issues, he examined in a profound way major questions and deeper truths, not only about Chinese culture, but about human nature, and has brought in, in his half a century of teaching in this country uh, brought in elements and an understanding uh, that of this rich heritage that is quite remarkable, uh, although perhaps not as yet fully discovered because most of his most important writing is still available only in Chinese. But how widely available? More than 30 books which span more than 2,000 years of history. He has stimulated younger scholars to rediscover not just the richness, but the variety of Chinese intellectual tradition. 
um, something which has been seriously lost uh, during the period of the so-called Cultural Revolution in China. His work is widely read and discussed throughout the Chinese-speaking world, as much on the mainland as in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and other parts of East Asia. It's been translated into uh, the other languages of many of the other languages of East Asia. Um, he has had four university professorships at Michigan, Harvard, Yale, and then mostly at Princeton, where he has been uh, emeritus is the emeritus professor of history and has been so uh, has been teaching for nearly two decades. Um, it gives me great pleasure both to be honoring one of the world's most ancient cultures and one of its most modern and forward-looking minds, someone who has made to the contribution to the intellectual traditions of China the kind of great and awakening contribution that John O. Franklin has made to our own culture. It gives me great pleasure to ask Professor Yu to come forward to accept the John W. Kluge Award. For Thank you very much, Dr. Binnington, for your kind words. I feel enormously honored to be a co-recipient of the John W. Kluge Prize in 2006, for which I'm grateful. After much reflection, however, I have come to the realization that the main justification for my presence here tonight is that both the Chinese cultural tradition and Chinese intellectual history as a discipline are being honored through me. The former has been the subject of my lifetime scholarly pursuit, and the latter, my chosen field of specialization. When I first became seriously interested in the study of Chinese history and culture. In the 1940s, the Chinese historical mind happened to be cast in an anti-traditionalistic mold. The Chinese past as a whole was viewed negatively, and whatever appeared to be uniquely Chinese was interpreted as a deviation from the norm of civilization's progress as exemplified in the historical development of the West. Needless to say, I was a, at a complete loss as to the Chinese cultural identity, and for that matter, also my personal identity. It was my good fortune that I was able to finish my college education in Hong Kong and pursued my graduate studies in the United States, now my adopted country. As my intellectual horizon gradually widened over the years, the truth was beginning to dawn on me that the Chinese culture must be clearly recognized as an indigenous tradition with characteristics distinctly its own. The crystallization of Chinese culture into its definitive shape took place in the time of Confucius, a crucial moment in the ancient world, better known in the West as the Axial Age. During this period, it has been observed a spiritual awakening or breakthrough occurred in several highly developed cultures uh, in the ancient world, including China, India, Persia, 
uh, Israel and Greece. It took the form of either philosophical reasoning or post-mythical religious imagination, or as in the case of China, a mixed type of moral, philosophical, and religious consciousness. The awakening led directly to the emergence of the, academy, the dichotomy between the actual world and the world beyond. The world beyond as a new vision provided the thinking individuals, be they philosophers, prophets, or sages, with the necessary transcending point from which the actual world could be examined and questioned critically as well as reflectively. This is generally known as the original transcendence uh, of the axial age. As a result of the Chinese original transcendence in the time of Confucius, the all-important idea of Tao emerged as a symbol of the world beyond vis-a-vis -vis the actual world of everyday life. But the Chinese transcendental world of Tao and the actual world of everyday uh, life were conceived from the very beginning uh, to be related to each other uh, in a way uh, different from other co ancient cultures undergoing the axial breakthrough. For example, uh, there is nothing in the early Chinese philosophical visions that suggests Plato's conception of an unseen eternal world of which the actual world is only a pale copy. In the religious tradition, the world of God and the world of humans, uh, as uh, demonstrated in the Christian type, is also absent. Nor do we find in classical Chinese thought, in all its varieties, anything that closely resembles the radical negativity of early Buddhism, with its insistence on the unrealness and uh, worthlessness of this world. By contrast, the world of Tao was not perceived as very far from the human world, as best expressed by Confucius. Quote, the Tao is not far from man. When a man pursues the Tao and remains away from man, his course cannot be considered the Tao, unquote. The, Tao, the notion of Tao was uh, also shared by all the major thinkers in the Chinese axial age, including Laozi, Mozi, and Zhuangzi. It was their common belief that Tao is hidden and yet functions everywhere in the human world. Even men and women of uh, common, of a uh, man of a uh, woman of uh, uh, simple intelligence can know and practice it in everyday life to a larger or lesser degree. Indeed, judging from the ever-growing and deepening influences of the ideas originating in the exhale age, uh, especially Confucian and Taoist ideas on all aspects of Chinese life down through the centuries, uh, it may not be too much an exaggeration to suggest that the that the Tao and history constitute the inside and the outside of Chinese civilization. Taking the Chinese cultural tradition to be essentially one of indigenous tradition and independent growth, I have tried over the decades to study Chinese history along two main lines. First, Chinese culture must be understood in its own terms, but at the same time, also in a comparative perspective. By comparative per uh, perspective, I refer to both Indian Buddhism in the early imperial period and Western culture since the 16th century. Since the beginning of the 20th century, the Chinese mind has been preoccupied with, pro with the problematic of China versus the West. 
to interpret the Chinese past solely in its own terms without a comparative perspective would certainly run the risk of falling into the age-old trap of Sinocentrism. Second, in my study of Chinese history from classical antiquity to the 20th century, uh, my focus has always been placed on periods of change when one historical stage moved to the next. Compared to other civilizations, China is particularly marked by its long historical continuity. But the continuity and the change went hand in hand in Chinese history. Therefore, the purpose I have set myself is twofold. Firstly, to identify the major intellectual, social, and cultural changes in the Chinese past. And secondly, to discern, if at all possible, the unique pattern of Chinese historical changes. More often than not, such broad and profound changes in Chinese history transcended the rise and the fall of dynasties. Thus, the notion of dynastic cycle, long held in traditional China, but also briefly invoked in the West, uh, is highly misleading. In the early years of the 20th century, Chinese historians began to reconstruct and reinterpret the Chinese past according to the historical model of the West. Since then, it has been generally assumed that China must have undergone similar stages of historical development as shown in European history. In the first half of the 20th century, Chinese historians adopted the earlier European scheme of periodization by dividing Chinese history into ancient, medieval, and modern periods. This has been replaced since 1949 by the Marxist-Stalinist five-stage formulation. The latter remains the orthodox in China up to this day, at least in theory, if not always in practice. This Procrustean approach, whatever merits it may have, otherwise cannot possibly do full justice to Chinese culture as an indigenous tradition. Only by focusing on the unique course and shape of Chinese historical changes, I am convinced, can we hope to see more clearly how that great cultural tradition moved from stage to stage, driven mainly, if not entirely, by its internal dynamics. Now let me turn to the question of how as two different systems of values, does Chinese culture stand vis-a-vis -vis Western culture in historical perspective? My earliest exposure to this question occurred in the late 1940s when the problematic of China versus the West uh, mentioned earlier dominated the Chinese intellectual world. It has been it has not been out of my consciousness ever since. Living in the United States for half a century, the question has acquired a truly existential meaning for my life as I move between the two cultures from moment to moment. With some initial psychological readjustments, I have long been able to enjoy the American way of life while still retaining my Chinese cultural identity. However, the best guide with regard to whether Chinese culture is compatible with the core values of the West can only be provided by Chinese history. China first encountered the modern West at the end of the 16th century, when the Jesuits came to do their missionary work in East Asia. The culturally sensitive Matteo Ricci was very quick to discover that the Chinese religious atmosphere at the time was highly tolerant. Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism were generally regarded as one and the same thing. It was this spirit of religious tolerance 
that accounted for Richie's extraordinary success in, conversion, in, the, in his conversion of many uh, leading members of the Confucian elite. The Confucian faith in the sameness of human mind and the universal accessibility of Tao to every human person anywhere led some Chinese converts to promote a synthesis of Christianity with Confucianism. The Chinese Tao was now ex further expanded to include Christianity. In the late 19th century, it was also the open-minded Confucians who enthusiastically embraced values and ideas dominant in the modern West, such as democracy, liberty, equality, rule of law, autonomy of the individual person, and above all, human rights. When some of them visited Europe or America for the first time and stayed there long enough to make first-hand observations, they were all deeply impressed, first of all, by the ideals and institutions of Western constitution, constitutional democracy. At the turn of the century, there were two rival Confucian schools in China, known as the New Text and the Old Text, respectively. Both advocated democracy and jointly began a systematic search for the origins and the evolution of democratic ideas in early Confucian texts. In so doing, it is clear that they took the compatibility between Chinese culture and Western culture as two systems of values for granted. Last but not least, I wish to say a word about human rights. Like democracy, human rights as a term is uh, linguistically specific to the West and non-existent in traditional Ch Confucian discourse. However, if we agree that the concept of human rights as defined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of 1948 is predicated on the double recognition of a common humanity and a human dignity then we are also justified to speak of a Confucian idea of human rights without the Western term, terminology. Recognition of common humanity and respect for human dignity are both clearly articulated in the Analects, Mencius, and other early texts. It is, it is remarkable that by the first century common era at the latest, the Confucian notion of human dignity was openly referred to in imperial decrees as sufficient grounds for the prohibition of the sale or killing of slaves. Both imperial decrees dated 9 and 35 common era respectively, uh, quote, Co uh, cited the same famous Confucian dictum, quote, of all living things produced by heaven and earth, the human person is the noblest, unquote. Slavery as an institution was never accepted by Confucianism as legitimate. It was the Confucian humanism that predisposed the late Qing Confucians to be so readily appreciative of the Western theory and the practice of human rights. If history is any guide, then there seems to be a great deal of overlapping consensus in basic values between Chinese culture and the Western culture. After all, recognition of a common uh, humanity and human dignity is what the Chinese Tao has been about. I'm more convinced than ever that once Chinese culture returns to the main flow of Tao, the problematic of China versus the West will also come to an end. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Yu. We will print and mail to each of you in the audience the full text of both Dr. Franklin's and Dr. Yu's remarks so that you may read and reread them later at your leisure. I must say you have sent us with these reflections over a long period of time into a, a higher realm, and we're about to go into another realm in the universal language of music as we welcome the president of the Curtis Institute, Roberto Diaz, and the Curtis gifted students from that Curtis Institute who will perform tonight. And we also welcome Jerry Lenfest, who made tonight's performance by the Curtis students possible. Jerry has been a great supporter of the library, a member of this from 15 years of this Madison Council, to which I've already spoken, is also chairman of the Curtis Institute's Board of Trustees. Now, both the library and the Curtis Institute um, owe much of their musical legacy, the place we're in tonight, to the generosity and commitment of extraordinary women patrons. Mary Louise Curtis Bach established the Curtis Institute in 1924, later set up an endowment to pay in full tuition and expense for all Curtis students. Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge in 1925 paid for the construction of this hall, set up an endowment to support free public cons concerts and commissions, which continue to this day. And Gertrude Clark Whittle, 10 years later, donated the set of Stradivarius instruments <clears throat> that the Curtis musicians will play tonight and also provide an endowment to have them perpetually maintained and specifically performed in concerts. So we're grateful to the Curtis Institute for helping us be true, faithful to this bequest by playing the Stradivarius instruments uh, that you will hear shortly. I should say that uh, Curtis also trained many uh, young composers who then went on to receive Library of Congress musical commissions, whose works were premiered here in this hall. Uh, first performance ever of Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring was commissioned by the Congress and performed by the library and performed here. And it has also their uh, distinguished graduates and friends of many personal collections now residing in the library. The collections of Samuel Barber and Leonard Bernstein, whose music will be performed tonight. Manuscripts by Lucas Foss, John Carlo Minotti, Ned Roram, many others have found their way to the Library of Congress to ride alongside original manuscripts we have of Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, Stravinsky, and many others. So we welcome this opportunity to further our connection to the Curtis Institute and its leaders and its talented students through tonight's performance. And we thank, once again, the Kluge Center honorees, the Kluge Prize winners, um, for lifting up our hearts, our imaginations, and our, the continuing struggle to understand in a context that is moral rather than just moralistic, and that is, it goes ever deeper into the common study of humanity, which we try to celebrate in the Kluge Center, which is just upstairs here. So I thank Jerry Lindfest and the Curtis Institute uh, for coming, and we look forward to uh, hearing uh, from these talented performers who, are, who will bring to you the music on Stradivarius instruments with which they have fallen, I gather, in love in the few days of performance. So we share that love with you, we thank you, and we look forward to lifting our hearts with the sounds of music.
Marvelous artists. We not only thank these marvelous artists, but I want to make two quick presentations to Roberto Diaz, the Curtis Institute, and to the chairman of its board, Jerry Lenfist, for bringing these amazing artists to us. These are facsimiles of two of the most cherished American compositions of the 20th century, of which we happen to be the custodians here at the library. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Barber's Adagio for Mr. Diaz, who is in charge of these wonderful artists, has brought them to this and has made this whole thing possible. Uh, Porgy and Bess for Jerry Ledfest. Thank so you. here we are. Thank you all. Thank you. And we now proceed with thanks once again to the musicians and praise once again for the Kluge Prize winners this year up 
stairs and out, up for dinner on the mezzanine floors, which is two floors up. We look forward to seeing you there and continuing this evening's celebration. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.